Well, uh, good morning and uh, good morning and good afternoon to everyone. Thanks a lot uh, to be today with us uh, uh, to follow this important session. Uh, I'm Alessia Rogai and I'm the Knowledge Management and Learning Coordinator of the Project Bridge the Gap. For those who didn't attend the last sessions and therefore maybe uh, know not a lot about the project Bridge the Gap. Uh, Bridge the Gap is in a European initiative coordinated by FIAP, the International Ibero-American Foundation for Administration Public Policies, in partnership with three European agencies for development and cooperation, the Spanish, the Italian and the Austrian, and two international NGOs, the European Disability Forum and the International Disability and Development Consortium. The initiative aims to contribute to the socioeconomic inclusion, equality and non-discrimination of persons with disability through a more inclusive and accountable institution and policies. In the framework of the knowledge management strategy developed within the project, we build a webinar-based training cycle to gradually explore the different cross-cutting issues taken into consideration by the uh, project action. The webinars are prepared and conducted by global and field experts selected by Bridge the Gap, the sessions are prepared to be as much as possible interactive, replicable and shareable. Already existing tools, documents and networks will, uh, are mobilized. Each webinar is conducted in English, in French and in Spanish in separate sessions. Uh, the first session of this training cycle was an introduction about the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disability, uh, also its principle and structure. The second last month was about the sustainable development goals. And uh, for those who missed them, you can find the videos and the first of the first and the second webinar together with the transcription and the learning materials on our uh, project website, on the Facebook and Twitter pages, and also on, you, on our YouTube channel. Um, I put the, the link of uh, the, the website and our social networks uh, here in the, in the chat box. So, well, today uh, we are here for the third session uh, titled Disability Inclusive Development, International Donors Strategies and Approaches on the Inclusion of Persons with Disability in Development and Cooperation. This session explores the links between disability and development and the role of international cooperation in promoting approaches and uh, to the inclusion of persons with disability. Uh, according with the United Nations, disability inclusive development means that all stages of development process are inclusive and accessible to persons with disability. It requires that all persons be afforded equal access to education, health, uh, work and employment, of course, and also social protection. Uh, well, uh, I think that today we are really lucky uh, because we will try to present some example and provide some suggestion of practical strategies or practical strategies um, for ensuring that all aspects of international development efforts are inclusive of persons with disability. Uh, and we have the chance to to have with us to present this important topic, um, Ola Bualgaib. Um, she's the director of the Global Influencing and Research of Leonard Cheshire, and uh, Ola uh, takes the lead in implementing the ambitious strategy of Leonard Cheshire to become the global partner of choice in disability, while significantly growing advocacy initiatives and partnership with K domestic and global actors. Ola represents Leonard Cheshire as a board member of the Global Disability Innovation Hub, but also she's a board member of the International Disability and Development Consortium, and uh, that is the organization partner of Bridge the Gap, uh, but also uh, at the Bone Disability and Development Group and together 2030 Global Initiative. She's also a board member at the Disability Rights Fund, and also she's uh, the representative um, in the Bridge of the Gap Steering Committee on behalf of IDDC. 
Uh, she has been a member of the advisory uh, bodies to support governments in social policy reform and recently involved in providing te technical expertise around effective reforms towards inclusive social protection policies. So at the end, uh, I could go ahead with also with your uh, curriculum, Ola, but I think that uh, we don't have really time because it's really, really articulated. And uh, for that reason, I said at the beginning that we have really the chance to to talk about this important topic with uh, Ola. So I don't want to uh, take more time. Uh, I just give you a couple of technical tips uh, that the webinar is live captioned and the link to follow the live captioning is here in the chat box. And uh, well, uh, I give the floor to Ola. Thanks to everybody. Thanks to Ola. You can start. Thank you, Alicia. Thank you, everybody, for showing interest to join the discussion today. Um, as you know all, it is a very timely discussion between all interested actors of answering the question, which we will try today to debate around, is it answered yet, and if not, why, and what needs to be done around it, is the issue about how to reach a more disability-inclusive development interventions in our countries and what is missing from that agenda that is still uh, unfortunately in many countries leaving many persons with disabilities out of any discussion or benefit from existing international development cooperation. So that the questions we will be looking at today and please for the audience if you have any questions to me Maybe you can keep a note of them and we can discuss them at the last part of the session when we open the floor for you to explore any points you want to raise or any clarifications you need around the points I will discuss. So coming back to the questions, I will be presenting to you some answers or, or as I said, more debating around is uh, how is disability inclusive development articulated within the Convention on Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Uh, are, are there enough strategies, uh, resources, um, collaboration since then on disability that can be seen enough to address the issues uh, and needs and rights of persons with disabilities more globally? And what needs to be done at national and global level between the different actors, and I mean donors, uh, governments, civil society, disability organizations, everybody who needs to be involved, civil society on a wide spectrum, what needs to be happening now to make the realities of persons with disabilities in, the, in their countries equal to their non-disabled peers? Uh, to start with the discussion, I would like first to raise uh, the question around what do we mean by development? Because we say disability inclusive development. And I think before starting to discuss the challenges around defining disability, we need to frame the issue around development in general. Development definitions vary, but one of them is very clear and we need to focus on, which looks at development not purely from an economic phenomenon, but rather more as a multidimensional process in involving reorganization, reorientation of, entire, of the entire economic and social system to ensure equality for all, all populations living in certain contexts. And this is very key for us to consider when we want to negotiate and argue for disability to be well mainstream, well articulated for, within, disability, within development interventions is to have that lens in mind that we are not only talking about financing, we will be talking about financing, but it is really that wider spectrum that needs to be inclusive, that needs to change to make those realities happen in a way that we want it to be for persons with disabilities. So again, discussions around development usually looks at 
ensuring equality of income and equality of access to basic services to all citizens. It ensures that whatever is in place in terms of institutions, structures, uh, strategies, is a ensuring respect of human rights, respect of dignity, supporting individual self-esteem. And again, when we discuss disability later, we will see that there are still issues around this as well. The third is about increasing people's freedoms to choose. And again, the freedom to choose is a huge challenge for persons with disabilities until now, unfortunately, in many countries, even in the developing world. So if I want to ensure people with disabilities freedom to choose, I have to ensure the availability of choices to them. And that's something, again, of a challenge which we also raise. So coming to the trying to define disability, and this is one of the, again, the issues of key concern until now, even though we thought that with the adoption of the UNCRBD, we have started to move towards a more of a rights-based approach. But unfortunately, still, in many countries, defining disability goes back to the tradition of looking at person with disability from the medical lens, even when it's articulated in national disability laws, in policies, even in programs. It varies in one country from one program to another, from one policy to another, and it doesn't look at how the convention articulated disability in a way that it is the interaction between the individual and the environment, and it's not only limited to the impairment an individual has. And, and this is, again, one of the barriers. So when we combine the discussion between disability and development, and we want those two together to be really working towards more inclusive approaches, we have to keep up in mind, again, this history, this inheritance about viewing disability from that narrow lens that looked at medical and charity approach. Uh, and again, that still um, thousands and thousands of people with disabilities are paying a price at country level of how is that translated into commitments, into programs. We know for a fact that in 2011, maybe that was more confirmed, but it was the case before we are not talking, when we talk about disability, we're not talking about hundreds, we're talking about around 600 million, 650 million persons with disabilities, around, which is around 10% of the global population. That was confirmed in the global disability report that was issued by WHO and the World Bank. And, and again, coming back to the narrow definition of disability, Unfortunately, because my countries have that narrow definition, we still see percentages not coming up higher than 2 to 3 percent. So for government officials, for donors coming back to why are we still struggling, if it's only seen as a 2 percent of the population, it is not the same if I am looking at 15 percent of the population. So that is one of the challenges and the causes of why Disability hasn't yet been a predominant topic on the disability and development agenda and push, pushing for more equality of access, equality of allocation, equality of impact. And that's why many people with disabilities are still, unfortunately, um, left behind. What we know for a fact that we have a lot of opportunities, it started with the UNCRBD um, 11 years ago, uh, when the convention came and confirmed this paradigm shift. And it did also, it didn't just confirm the rights of persons with disabilities as equal to others. So we, it didn't come up, as we know, with new rights. It just stated disability rights is human rights. It did confirm another key focus around the participation, which was not 
the case in many other conventions around persons with disabilities. So participation of persons with disabilities, assurance of consultation with persons with disabilities through their, their organizations along the cycle of development, along the cycle of uh, policy design, implementation, monitoring, and evaluation is well articulated in many articles in the convention. So that is an opportunity that have promoted some progress in many countries that have ratified the convention, but I would still argue it is not in the right level where we were expecting it to be. So in terms of achievement, we have 178 countries that ratified the convention. It's a great achievement, but the, the progress in those countries of making uh, the right changes, not just in the articulation of narratives, but more concretely around changing programs, changing finances to be more inclusive, changing attitudinal barriers, changing infrastructure barriers. Again, this is a slower trend, unfortunately, and it may start to pick up in one thematic area, but it doesn't flow to other policies equally. So coming back to what did the convention confirm? As I said, it is in many articles, but in one of them, there was a like a clear articulation, which is Article 32, because in that one, it states that the international cooperation, including international development programs, is inclusive and accessible to persons with disabilities. It also confirmed in doing so, it has to be done in close consultation with persons with disabilities. And this continuously comes up in many of the articles in the convention, this confirmation of nothing about us without us, this confirmation about, we're not just saying mention disability, there is a clear indication under each of the articles, what are we talking about? So when, if there is an explicit intention to include disability in any development interventions, the convention can certainly be a starting point. Definitely we know that there is a need for technical understanding, there is a need for capacity building, but we know we're not starting from nothing. There is a lot out there that can be grabbed and built on. Another opportunity which we have right now and we didn't have three years ago, which is around the sustainable development goals. We know that the MDGs failed disability. It did have some minor attention to it, but unfortunately, overall, disability slipped the lines of looking into development around the MDGs. But with a strong emphasis and advocacy and active engagement of disability movement within the drafting of the SDGs, we managed to have more of a predominant articulation again within the goals, within the indicators, within the ongoing discussions now around it. So this is again an opportunity that we shouldn't miss. Yet the concern we are close to be three years from that opportunity and we can see in many countries things are not again moving as we were expecting and that's why we don't want to be missed across the lines and we reach 2030 where disability is on the top of the list that we would claim unfortunately we left the disability community behind from development interventions so we need to be aware of this opportunity and try to make best use of it so in terms of evidence, I would like to share with you uh, a bit briefly on where, where are we now in terms of progress. So for example, we have just completed that Leonard Cheshire a four years uh, research project in four countries across Africa. It was in Kenya, Uganda, Zambia, and Sierra Leone. And, and the research looked specifically about whether there is an existing gap of access and impact for persons with disabilities compared to their non-disabled peers around social protection, education, health, 
and employment. And unfortunately, the evidence gathered confirmed that there are huge variances between disabled and non-disabled community members around those four areas. Uh, of course, even things became worse when we are talking about certain types of disabilities. Things also became worse when we're talking about persons with disabilities living in rural areas. So it wasn't new, yet it was another additional confirmation that disability is continuously being mm -hmm. failed in development interventions. Another evidence that was recently gathered was around how far financing around education is inclusive to disability, which was an initiative that was run by IDDC uh, around education. And that evidence also showed that when financing education, there are some ad hoc attempts to, to be inclusive to disability, yet unfortunately, it is still not enough. It's not comprehensive. And in many cases, the progress between different donors is not equally addressed. So looking at that as an additional eye-opener that we, there are opportunities of starting the journey, but not enough to be changing realities on the ground. I have also done um, a piece of research three years ago um, around understanding how donors' trends changed uh, after the convention when supporting the disability organizations. And I did that through a global consultation with disability organizations, but I also reviewed a lot of donors' policies and strategies to see that change in narrative and systems. And I also interviewed those individuals to try to understand what's working and what's not. The striking finding for me from that study was that many DBOs came back saying, we are not able to access funding. We can see it is more out there in calls for proposals, but either we don't know about it or we know very late. We or either we can't apply for it because of the conditions, because it asks for you to have large number of staff, large amounts of budgets, capacities that we don't have, or it also asks you for high, to be written in English, well written, so it would require from us to hire consultants to do it and we don't have the resources to do it. So it was very interesting to be engaging with the DBOs around this because it was an eye-opener that Yes, maybe things to the outside world seem to be looking okay, but actually from the other side, things are still failing for disability organizations to pick up the momentum and to be equal actor, actors and counterparts, to have the capacities to voice when things are going wrong and have the capacities to engage equally. They also voiced around the challenges for reporting mechanisms for those donors they said it, it was so complicated for them that they couldn't respond even when they got these small grants, or in many cases, they were partnering with big INGOs that actually the lead was given to them, to the INGOs, and they were given small minor pieces for them to lead on. So this, again, was another evidence that showed there's a lot of things that still need to be improved for assuring more inclusive practices and inclusive support for disability. And as I said, the causes of that are issues around understanding. So the understanding of this twin track approach to disability and development, which was discussed in like May, I think it started in late 90s, of saying disability for this for development to be inclusive to disability, it has to look at two streams of, of work. So ensuring that disability is well mainstreamed across all interventions, but also have in mind to put them on equal basis with others, there has to be still a, more of a targeted disability specific programs that may look at uh, empowerment programs that may look at uh, disability specific services that needs to be given to certain types of disabilities. Um, issues like support services like 
personal assistant, sign language interpreters, etc. So again, this is still there is a lot of learning from development actors, from governments around those issues. There is the issue of financing coming back to that. So there are huge discussions globally now about financing for development. I know disability is act players and specifically the disability movement is trying to voice around that space. But again, more efforts needs to be done around this because A, we need the understanding, B, we need the political commitment, but C, we need the money for it. And without that three triangle, it will not work for, for us to ensure more uh, inclusion uh, and disability. And I feel on this aspect, there is a lot of learning that needs to be generated from the gender movement because uh, mainstreaming gender perspectives in development took a lot of time, but eventually, I know we, we haven't achieved what was the ambition many years ago, but still, there is huge success in many countries around different areas. And the only reason behind that, because it looked at gender more as a comprehensive approach that needs to be addressed across all the lines of, of thinking around development, starting from even at government level, from legislations, policies, programs, looking at consultation levels, looking at monitoring, looking at engagement in political spaces. So without all that comprehensive view, I don't think that gender uh, mainstreaming would have succeeded as it is right now. Other issues that are also disability specific, which we need to keep in mind if we want to, to start thinking to move forward in our thinking around um, ensuring more inclusive practices is the issue of non-discrimination. Because non-discrimination, of course, relates to everybody beyond disability, but on disability specific, we have even seen that many development practices may discriminate against certain types of disabilities. So you may see a lot of programs, for example, in one country, implemented supporting persons with physical disabilities, but you may not find equally the case for children with um, hearing impairment or children with um, learning difficulties or intellectual disabilities. So, so again, the discriminate, the anti-discrimination policies in countries needs to look into equality of interventions between disabled and non-disabled, but also equally within the disability community. It had to look, it has to look about gender equality because we know that intersectionality between gender and disability is an additional barrier. We know that when it comes to certain disabilities, there is an additional attitudinal barriers as well, and community and stigma uh, barriers around it. So, so for me, the non-discrimination acts are very key to start with, not just in national policies, but also in development interventions and in practices, even around financing, monitoring, etc. The issue of accessibility, of course, is specific to disability because when we say equality of access, we talk about access, of course, ensuring accessibility of information, but we talk about environmental access, we talk about access in terms of functionality of the individual. So on this one, again, it, a, it is a wide spectrum of understanding. And if development interventions doesn't consider that, they will automatically exclude people with disabilities, even if it's articulated here and there in the narrative. So I give an example if I am saying I want to mainstream persons with disabilities in this massive program about inclusive education. But if in my finances I haven't allocated specific budgets to support children with disabilities in their additional cost to reach schools because they need accessible public transport, I immediately excluded them from the program. And there are many examples like this where we have to have this informed thinking about designing 
our in development interventions that would look in this comprehensive manner. Another key thing with I, which I touched on, upon earlier, but I would like to come back to, is the issue of participation. Engaging with people with disabilities, engaging with parents' organizations, engaging with disability organizations is very crucial. And I'm talking here about national organizations, local organizations that are really fully engaged, fully aware about the issues, and should be leading the discussions when talking about development and disability. They should be around the table and they, and meaningful participation means not just bringing them in saying, oh, we don't, we want to consult with you because we have this program. It should go more, much deeper of starting from the beginning, consulting with them, what are the issues they think are of concern to them, designing our development interventions in a way that addresses those issues and continuously partner and collaborate with them during the implementation in a way that ensures we are responsive to those needs we have made commitment around. And this ties so much up with the monitoring mechanisms. Coming back to the convention, the convention, the CRBD was very articulate around Article 33 of saying national monitoring mechanisms needs to be in place and needs to be inclusive. And it looks at different structures like, A, the one about this focal point and coordination mechanism within the government settings. And on that one, there was again the confirmation that persons with disabilities through their organizations need to be a key player. There was also this independent uh, monitoring actors which are, should be in full consultation with civil society and government, but should be sort of playing this watchdog role, ensuring that government commitments are moving forward, ensuring that there is a clear accountability system and complaint when things are going wrong. And of course, we talked about the financing issues, we talked about the capacity building, because again, we are aware that mm, in some cases, policymakers are right. They do have the political will, but they don't know how to do it. Many donors are interested to be inclusive to disability, but they don't know where to start. So this issue about access to information, this issue about capacity building is very key to try to change that reality. And also the collaboration between actors. We know that, for example, the, the GLAD network which is a collaboration between development donors interested in disability to continuously coordinate, agree on priorities. That was a very good practice to start to bring the discussion together rather than having this ad hoc fragmented uh, work around disability. We know around the disability movement globally, again, initiatives and understanding of priorities is agreed that continuously working towards the disability agenda within development discussions. What is really missing is, again, as I said, this comprehensive view. When we are looking at disability, it's not an additional development intervention in countries. It has to come across all the discussions. So, for example, discussions in countries about poverty elevation strategies. Disability needs to be at the center of that. Because we know for a fact that the interest of governments, the interest of many development actors goes to this one. And if we miss this ability from the starting point, it will be continuously left behind. And then we start to argue for creating these small scale development interventions that should try to bridge that gap. And in many cases, it doesn't work because it isn't a small scale, non-sustained, addressing maybe certain types of disabilities and missing many others. Similarly, when we're talking about universal health design because and coverage, because again, that is where we need to focus on. If health systems are inclusive to disability, then we ensure you know, better living health conditions for persons with disabilities. They don't have to be challenged around affordability and availability and accessibility of services if universal health coverage is inclusive to that from the beginning. 
We also have to be aware, I know we're talking about disability in development, but we know in many contexts, uh, conflict and humanitarian um, realities are also putting people with disabilities in additional challenges. And there is sometimes, in many cases, there is this transition to look into development in those uh, countries or, or contexts. And again, disability seems to be, in many cases, missed from that discussion. So we need to be aware of those opportunities and we need to be ensuring that in that transition from humanitarian conflict um, realities into development, that disability comes along as a natural sense as any other discussion. Um, another point about financing, we talked about financing to be inclusive to disability in terms of quantity we also need to be ensuring in terms of quality because financing can go against disability because if I am a donor that comes in and sponsor a program that is against a human rights, that is against the disability principles, that is against the CRBD um, you know, uh, principles and articulations, that puts us back 10 years behind. So for example, if I'm a donor and they come in and support segregated schools in a country, of course, the government will say, well, the donor came in and this is what they support. That confirms realities where, where it's almost impossible to change for years to come. So we have to be aware of, of following up more closely about development interventions in a way that to ensure that it is responsive, it is reflective of what is being discussed. And my last point that I just wanted to confirm with you before we open the floor for questions is really, again, around the principles we talk about, the human rights. So the human rights approach is really very clear about the principles. It is talking about anti-discrimination, it's talking about empowerment, it's talking about participation, it's talking about inclusion, it's talking about equality. So all of these principles are very clear and if we keep that in mind when we discuss about disability and development keep in mind the definition I talked about earlier which is ensuring that social systems along the economic systems are inclusive to disability that is the only way where we can guarantee there is a more of a substantial change in persons with disabilities lives and and development cooperation is more sensitive, is more responsive to that. And by 2030, we will be celebrating rather than criticizing the fact that people with disabilities are out of the system. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks a lot, Ola. Really, really thanks uh, for this uh, really interesting presentation. Now we can start, as you said before, uh, the plenary session. So you please uh, uh, make your question uh, to all and take the, the opportunity to, to have her uh, for uh, the rest of the session. Um, you can text your question in the chat box uh, and I will read them one by one or you can just raise your hands and I uh, will give you directly the floor to make your question to Ola. So I I can see that there are already some questions. So we have a question from uh, Do Lawrence, and uh, the question is: uh, inclusion is about leaving no one behind. It's time for persons with disability to drum more of for their agenda, however, being sensitive about other marginalized children, people need to be looked at, uh, at as alias and collaborators. Any comments? Just so it was a comment, so I'll give you the floor again, Ola. So. Yes, I fully agree with you on that point, because the beauty of the SDGs is that it looked at all most marginalized communities. So it didn't just look at disability, but looked at all these wider community members that needs to be brought in to ensure everybody is on equal steps of others when we're looking about growth and 
and uh, inclusion of all in any countries or development interventions. And that's why it is very key in many of those countries where the governments had made commitment to the SDGs is we align our efforts with other civil society actors and align our efforts with those groups. Because if I'm a government uh, representative or a donor and I today I meet with you and discuss disabilities and tomorrow I meet with the women's groups and after tomorrow I meet with the children uh, association, etc. Again, uh, attempts will be um, scattered and and it will be a more of a competition. But if there is a joint agenda in those countries of saying these are the priorities overall for all community members, where disability is predominant mentioned, we will have a stronger capacity to change the realities for everybody, including us. So I would advise and advocate for that as a way forward. And it is been that there are a lot of good practices out there. So we're engaged with um, civil society networks supporting disability organizations in, in Bangladesh, in Kenya, in many countries where, as I said, because disability organizations are part of this more of a wider civil society advocacy discussions, things are moving in a, better, in a much better sense. Thanks a lot. We have another uh, question from Amda. Uh, what's the role? Uh, what uh, what the role of NGOs play in promoting inclusive education in low-income countries? So NGOs, of course, as you all know, before the convention, NGOs were really actually leading the good practice in many countries because. Governments had some attempts of looking into inclusive education, but it, it was hardly the case in many low-income countries, a little bit the case in middle-income countries. So now with the, with the convention and with governments starting to pick up disability as a concept around education, so actually the role of INGOs is stronger, but I see it as three levels. One is to continue to... Um, implement these inclusive uh, programs around inclusive education to show that what is working, what needs to be done, what is the right way to give the governments the sense that it is possible, it is cost effective and it's working. The second responsibility I see for INGOs is to continue to be actively involving and engaging as equal actors the disability organizations along the process. Because again, without that, they will miss the deeper understanding of the communities. They will act in on behalf of persons with disabilities, which shouldn't be the case. And, and again, their efforts will be minimized because at the end of the day, they will not have the resources, the financial resources, I mean, to continuously develop these programs alone. They will not have the capacity to implement that to all students with disabilities in those countries. The third role I see for INGOs is again to provide the technical understanding and knowledge to governments and to donors around what needs to be replaced. They have been, we have been in there before the convention and we can really bring a lot of understanding and, and, and sense on what needs to happen. So another question, Parag asks, how to ensure country level monitoring of CRPD and SDGs implementation? So that's a challenge because again, from practice, so I was involved in a, in a research we've done um, last year to try to understand this specifically. And I will share with Alicia the findings of that. In few countries we looked we worked with DBOs very closely to try to understand a how DBOs are involved in the existing national monitoring systems around SDGs, but also to understand how are they involved in their countries around the CRVD monitoring systems. What we found is that both systems don't speak to each other. So CRVD monitoring is alone, SDG monitoring is alone, and nobody is talking to each other. So that on its own is a problem. We also found out that disability organizations are a little bit more involved in the disability monitoring than the SDGs. As I said earlier, there are some starting to be good practices, but in general, this is not the case. 
So for me, the recommendation to move forward is a, the government and disability organization and donors needs to ensure that two systems talk to each other because they need to feed into each other. And B, again, to ensure that disability organizations have should have a much more stronger role to play in both structures and even more independently to lead on discussions in both. Thanks, Ola. And then uh, Priscilla is asking, where is the place of education in this move of disability inclusive development? Well, definitely, because we, we have talked at the beginning about um, you know, um, the medical and, and uh, charity approach. We know that uh, culture, we know that attitudes are a huge barrier. Stigma around disability, discrimination around disability starts with the individuals. And this is um, changing mindsets, changes with education, changes with how the media is looking into disability. Our children, when they are taught in school, a used to have non-disabled -dis peers sitting next to them, but also seeing disability reflected in the curriculum, growing with the understanding that we live in inclusive societies, uh, higher education system is inclusive to disability. As I said, all the system around um, media, around education policies in the countries, if it's all inclusive, that is the only way things change and also trying to promote the, you know, the role models. I'm not, I'm not always a big fan of saying, you know, people with disabilities are perfect and they are successful and they are the best in the world. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying in many cases, people challenge the fact that people with disabilities can be effective employees, people with disabilities can be learners, can be. So we need to, to bring more evidence that sorry, this is not the case. We are and we can do it. And this is the evidence to showcase that it can happen. Many thanks. Uh, another question from Bahadir. Uh, what do you think are the biggest challenges on the road from mere consultation to co-production in the context of international development? Interesting question. Uh, so I, I think that I, I will keep confirming the issue of you know the international um, actors and mainly the international cooperation actors and donors play a huge role because they in many cases they are the you know the, the breaking point of of deciding on how things need to be shared because we know without finances, things doesn't move. And, and that, is, um, that is a power. And if used in the right direction, it can really make a substantial change of the thinking, of the planning, of how things are put in practice um, in, in many of the development interventions. And that's why we need to have a very close eye on that and collaborate with those actors, not to you know, stand uh, in, in behind and criticize, but more say, we're happy to collaborate. Let's see how we can change that reality forward. Oh, another uh, comment from Jay. Uh, we know that disability is the result, it's the results from the interaction between persons with impairments and barriers. Do we have, do we really need to use uh, terms disability development, why can't we just say inclusive development? Inclusive means all. Well, I agree with you. I mean, there are always debates about whether we need to mention disability or not, or how to mention it. Because, uh, you know, I have been involved with when the World Bank was discussing the safeguard policies. And I remember in those discussions as well, there was a long debate whether do we just mention disability in the narrative or do we need to have additional information? And the agreement was we need both. I, I mean, I agree with you. Inclusive development should be responsive to disability because that's what inclusion is about. Inclusion means everybody. Yet because we are seeing 
that things are still not moving, even though there are all these nice frameworks, all these, we need to continuously come in and say, for disability, inclusive development is for everybody, but for disability, this is what we are talking about. Because we know it is a bit different from gender, because on gender, we're talking about things maybe are a bit more clear. We're talking about male and female, and we're talking about equality and all that. On disability, some may claim, they may come back to you and say, disability is expensive. Disability is difficult. It can be only done by experts. So that's why we come in and say, now for, for, for development to be inclusive to disability, this and this needs to happen. And no, it doesn't cost a lot if you start it from the beginning. And no, it's not complicated and it doesn't need experts if you put the right system in place at the beginning. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't stress so much about the articulation. I would stress more about the approach of how are we looking into it? How are we addressing disability when we're talking about inclusive development? It is the confirmation that it is equality of all. It is leaving no one behind where disability is one of those groups, not the only one. But for disability to be inclusive, we need A and B and C. Because without that, you can just mention it, of course, but in practice, we will be excluded. Thanks, Ola. Uh, another uh, really interesting question from Bester. And uh, you talk about your during your presentation that the access to funding is uh, one of the most important ac action. But uh, you also write when you say that NGOs are not really qualified to access funding from organizations due to the high level criteria. And uh, so the question is, what can state actors do to ensure that DPOs are accessing funding from organizations in the interest of persons with disability? Okay, so on this one, there are actually some good practices which we need to respond to. So my response to you would be on two tracks again. One would be governments in Europe, for example, they do provide some support to disability organizations not to do the advocacy work, but more to give them the basic support, the core cause to ensure that they are existing. So I don't want to take money from the government and then be embarrassed to advocate against it when things go wrong. But I, I still have need that basic funding that keeps me surviving as an organization and not continuously struggle to have the same basics of paying the rent. I worked very closely with many organizations on the ground and I know I I was chairing one disability organization and I saw how difficult it is on daily basis to run the disability organization with very minimal resources. So there has to be this core funding, whether it's government, whether it's private sector, whether it's collaboration between donors, it has to be in place. Now this doesn't exist. In many countries, many disability organizations are either run by, by the board because of there are no money for the board to bring more staff, or they are fully dependent on projects. So when the project ends, they stop working when another project comes in. So it's not directed around their own strategies. It's more about who's in the field, who are the INGOs running programs. And then, so today I'm doing education because this INGO has a program and they're supporting it. Tomorrow I'm doing employment because this INGO has a program and they have some support for me. This doesn't, this is not the way it should be. It should be the other way around. It should be disability organizations having this basic funding having their own strategies based on their realities, their members' realities, and then they choose where to work and how, based on how they see it happening. So this is a, this is the most important one. The other one is coming on the responsibility of the donors. Because, they, you know, of course there is a need for financing bigger programs with millions, but there is a need for this small scale programs that needs to come directly to disability organizations with little requirement, with the flexibility around accountability. I mean, sorry about monitoring and evaluation, but it's very simplified in a way that they can respond to that. And there is, again, coming back to the learning from the gender movement, 
there was a lot of, of you know, and still existing uh, funding initiatives. The Disability Rights Fund is one example of that, where they also started with the convention, providing these small grants. Other NGOs have some examples as well, but it's not enough. It's not responding to the global need, and that's why donors need to create their own mechanisms as well at country level to respond to that. So if I'm a development actor and I have, I don't know, funding to disability, which is 20 million, at least, I don't know, 10% of it needs to be allocated for disability organizations with a smaller scale funding, with a simplified system, with proper access to information and support for people to respond to it. Thanks, Ola. Another question from Jay. Uh, do you think the disability organization should also invite other development organizations while discussing on disability issues? Because uh, on my experience on the CBR uh, conference, for example, we can see only the disability organization that are invited by the conference. I, I, I cannot agree more with you on this one. My, my challenge all the time is I feel we're always talking to each other. <laughs> it's the same community everywhere, wherever you go. And we keep saying the others are not doing it enough, but we are not reaching out enough to them. A, to know we exist. B, to know what we are talking about, why we're talking, understanding it, supporting them, be more inclusive to us in it. So I, I fully agree with you. The efforts until now are not enough to reach out, to be more uh, proactive, to bring those key players into our space and the other way around. Thanks. Um, and another interesting question by Virendra Ray. Uh, in most of the development countries, the disability inclusive development plan has not been adopted unless there is direct engagement of persons with disabilities the policy making level. So my question is, she said, uh, how can people with disability can make intervention for their political participation so that the disability issues can be heard while drafting the policy? Yes, um, I understand fully the challenge because as I said, I don't think anyone will argue the fact, yes, people with disabilities, yes, disability organizations need to be brought in, consulted, for example, in any drafting on anything related to communities. So it's not just about disability. So let's assume the government is doing a reform around gender policy or they are doing a reform about um, social insurance. If disability miss that discussion, the whole system, when it's built, it will miss disability specific issues. The challenge always is the know-how, the no, no, sorry, the knowledge that this consultation is happening. I've seen in many countries disability organizations either know after the adoption of that law or at a very final stage where even voicing is too late. So again, this is where the link up to other national setups, networks, is so important because. It, in advocacy work, as you all know, I'm sure everybody in the call, our experience around advocacy is the moment of knowing about, about what's going on, engaging at the right moment, but also having the right people to go and engage. Because if, even if I'm a disability organization, I know that within our group, there may be stronger people in terms of you know, either negotiating or knowing the, the technicalities of things, you need to send the right person to the meeting. You need So A, you need to know about it, send the right person. And once you spot there is a challenge or an opportunity, gather efforts with other disability organizations, other civil society, don't act alone because that's not going to be enough. For governments to pay attention, and we have seen that from other social movements, it has to be a joint effort. If you gather the efforts, continuously, don't stop, don't give up. Use the media, use your networks, other networks, and that is the only way to continuously. You may fail once, but you will for sure succeed in the future. And it's, it is learning by doing, but it is the only way of grasping this politics around policy design 
politics around reform, because as I said, it is the right moment knowing about it, it's engaging with the right people and it's voicing when you need to do it. Thanks a lot. I have, I read just a, a couple of questions more. Um, one again from Jay say asks, do you think uh, the training models on disability should also include in the development agenda? And then I have another uh, question from Julius who reflect about many times children with disability are left behind because they don't have a voice. How efficiently can their parents be used to help them reach their full potential looking about the children with disability? Thank you. So on the first point, of course, I mean, what I mentioned earlier about the capacity building and the training. Training is not enough. I'm, I'm, I, it's not, I'm not against training, but I think it's a starting point. So definitely providing training and capacity building, understanding disability, understanding the principles of it, understanding what the convention, I'm sure even you on the call, you have read the convention, but each time you read it, you will learn something new. So the articles are really explicit. And the more we interpret them, the more you take time to, to take them into practice, the better it is. And we and that's something we need to do with other actors we believe are, are crucial to, to help us, to work with us, to change that. So I would say start with training, but don't stop there because that's not the end of the story. You need to continuously engage with those actors. That's how they will learn. They will learn more from engaging with you than just a few days of training or a toolkit or a report. The second point which speaks to the first one is, yes, even if you are not involved, you need to bring people in. Go and, and organize meetings with those actors. Introduce yourself. They may not invite you the first time, but once they know about you, once they see your work, engage them, even if it's in small activities, they will learn that you exist and and we have an opportunity now because more and more many of the development actors are sensitive to engaging with disability organizations there is still not enough at national and local level so we need to continuously uh, be out there be out there and and just say this is who we are this is what we think needs to happen and we need you to engage us because you will learn a lot from us and we have the right to be included in your discussion. So be assertive around this because there is no discussion anymore of why that needs to be the case. Thanks a lot. Uh, we have another really interesting uh, question from Birendra Ray. Multilateral donors have still not prioritized disability inclusive targets in their funding grid. How can DPOs exhibit their capabilities to influence which donors allocating funds to achieve disability inclusive targets of SDGs? So on that one, um, it's easy and difficult because yes, you, I mean, disability organizations are not the decision makers here, it's donors who decide their strategies. So I would recommend gather as much as evidence as you can and, and voice. And voicing doesn't mean demonstrating in the streets. It could start of you gathering evidence about, I don't know, if there is a, if there are five programs in your community around education and none of them is disability sensitive, write an article in the newspaper, send them an email saying that, you know, we, we would like to come and meet you because we have huge concerns that your programs, I am sure they will respond to you, as I told you. And go aim, aim high. Aim high, I mean, interact with, the, with their teams, but if it doesn't work, go to the senior person, arrange a meeting with them. It's not easy, I know. So in many cases, you may be ignored and your email will drop somewhere, but at some point it will be picked up, believe me. So you need to constantly voice when you feel things are going wrong, gather the evidence, always gather evidence. So I know we're talking now, somebody could come and challenge me and say, no, all what you're saying is nonsense, it's not true. We have supported five years ago this 
But if I have the evidence and tell him, no, in 2017, in 2016, you invested six million in education. You only supported a program with $50,000. He can't counter argue that if this is a fact. So do your homework. When you do it right, you will change and you will see. Thanks, Hora. I have a uh, last question, apparently. And uh, Jay asks, there is a huge gap in the knowledge and capacity of international level DPOs and national level DPOs. Is there any mechanism for supporting the national DPOs? Uh, we, I mean, it, of course, I would advise you in your country because it varies from one country to another. I know it's very challenging, but it is your right to say we need the support. So I would start. I don't know which country you're in. I would understand who are, for example, the development actors in your country. Like if there are donors, like I don't know, I'm just saying names like European Commission, DFAT, DFAT um, the Norwegians, uh, all of those actors are in, in, engaged globally around disability, I would go and meet them and say, you, the, you know, the convention says this, the SDGs say this, everybody says disability organization needs to be involved. We need your support. You need, we need your support because we, we're lacking funding. We need to develop our strategies. We need better capacity building. We need more resources. So as I said, you need to constantly reach out and also seek the support from the, you know, the like um, regional networks on disability, like in Africa, it's African Disability Forum, in the Asian Disability Forum. If you fail, maybe try to reach out to IDA, International Disability Alliance. So there, now the network of disability is very well known. It's not like 10 years ago where, I don't know, a DBO in Uganda is really completely disconnected on what's going on. Now it's much easier. So make the attempts and if you if you if it doesn't work at national level try to reach out to you know networks beyond that because it is the same actors everywhere so i'm sure with, with time things will change but it i mean the progress in each country will differ Uh, thanks, Ola. Uh, uh, we have just uh, two more questions and uh, that I will read together. The first one is from Teresa. Uh, to be fully comprehensive, how should we report, record co-disability, for example, in mental health programs, uh, a person with mental health problems who has an additional disability or whose care uh, has a disability? And also, Sylvester uh, is asking about uh, hearing impairments. So, what can you recommend to have hearing impairment uh, persons feel more inclusive? Because they always feel more e exclusive uh, to the fact that they are challenged uh, with the sign language interpretation, for example. Okay, thank you. So, the first question. Um in terms of classification of disability, which I think your question was around that, it speaks to my um, uh, discussion early on about the challenges of defining disability at country level. There are huge issues because at country level, if the government defines disability only around physical and you know all the obvious disabilities and hearing and visual impairment, and then it excludes other types of disabilities, then that's where you need to focus. And I'm not saying you as an individual, but I mean more the disability movement is challenging the government to widen that, 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 that definition. The second challenge usually is the classification system. So, for example, there are disability benefits and sometimes the eligibility would say for you to be considered in this cash transfer scheme is that you need to have a, a disability percentage above 70%. And you need to be passing through this medical or disability assessment. And this is another barrier because in many countries, this assessment is usually purely medical. And that puts you off because that will either decide you're in or out. So again, that's another area where you, as a disability movement, you need to focus around and see how it is working, how it is 
classifying personal disabilities, defining who's disabled and who's not, and try to push for a more of an inclusive uh, assessment mechanism that is more fair to people with disabilities, that is inclusive to all. So these are policy decisions, but very, very key because they make the choice of many people in your community with disabilities of accessing education, employment, benefits, etc. So on the question about uh, the inclusion of all persons with disabilities and specifically around persons with hearing impairments, I hear you. I fully understand that, you know, with sign language interpretation, it is a challenge to engage in community. It is a challenge to engage within the wider disability movement. So, A, I would recommend if there are disability organizations that are responsive, like sometimes there are deaf unions, or I would start there reaching out to them, being a member of those disability organizations. If there aren't, at least reach out to existing disability organizations in general and try to be engaging with them because the more you are in with them, in the discussions they make, the more you're active, the better it is in when they discuss disability issues with the government, with donors, you ensure that the community around um, and persons with hearing impairments and the deaf community are also being addressed. So your needs, your rights are equally addressed to the community with physical disabilities, the communities with um, hearing impairments, etc. So this is my advice to you, be proactive, try to engage, try to engage with civil society, but and I know it's easier maybe at the beginning to engage more with the disability community advocacy groups, because that's your route of really, again, voicing, ensuring that yours and others within your community issues are addressed. Uh, thanks a lot, Carla. Uh, we don't have uh, any other questions in the chat box. So um, I'm going to, to close the, the session. And uh, first of all, uh, thanks a lot for dedicating your time uh, to us today. And also I would like to thank the, the, the whole audience. Uh, I really hope that today the session tell you something and clarify some doubts about this important topics. Uh, so while well, we arrive at this at the end of this third session about disability inclusive development and just a couple of uh, last things uh, before leaving you. The webinar training cycle or issues the certificate of attendance only to those whom will attend at least 75 percent of the webinar and uh, respond to the satisfaction survey we, you will receive uh, with the follow-up email. The 75% of the training course correspond to the 9 out of 12 webinars and you will re receive uh, uh, all this information also in the, in the follow-up e emails together with the recordings of the webinar and the learning materials. Uh, the, next the next session will take place after the summer break, so at the end of the um, September and it will be about inclusive and accessible project cycle management. Uh, the session will try to prepare the, and increase the skills in the application of the key inclusion concept and tools in the project cycle uh, management. We will give you more information about uh, this, uh, the fourth session of our um, webinar uh, training cycle. Uh, as soon uh, as possible, I think uh, at the end of uh, at least at the end of the at the end of June. Thanks a lot. Thanks all again. Thanks to everybody, and uh, have a nice end of the day. Uh, I will keep you posted. Bye. Bye bye.